From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. The government is running a deliberate program to scare people witless. So you've got people who are now frightened to leave their homes in case they get this virus. But by the way, most people recover from it. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. We see the Chinese Communist Party also for what it is, the central threat of our times. If you are spreading the gospel, the Chinese government will treat you as a criminal. And you can see the two towers, a huge explosion now raining debris on all of us. We better get out of the way. But more than 11,000 people are now thought to have been killed in Southern Asia after an undersea earthquake sent enormous waves rolling across the Indian Ocean. But Iran's regime is not merely a Jewish problem, any more than the Nazi regime was merely a Jewish problem. The church must understand that trouble is right at our doorstep, that we simply aren't ready for it, and we need training. Welcome to part two of the Gateway module of the Amiga programme. So, as we've already described in part one, the Gateway is a taster for the overall programme and it's designed just to give you a, a glimpse as to what uh, follows uh, to make a decision as to whether you want to uh, commit to it. So in part one of the Gateway, uh, we actually looked at uh, some of the major developments in the world situation and the present state of the church. Um, now, I'm a management consultant, uh, I'm a management trainer by profession and, and, and sometimes we talk about when we launch a new project we talk about something called the burning platform. The burning platform is, is essentially the fact that the situation has changed so badly that we have to do something, with, there has to be some kind of action, there has to be some kind of response. In other words, doing nothing is not an option. And what I hope that I did in uh, part one of the Gateway was actually to start to, to build that picture, the fact that the society, the world is changing, is, is falling so quickly, um, is going downhill that uh, Christians have to, have to respond. So in part two, we'll begin to explain the relevance of Bible prophecy. Um, and just a recommendation, really, if you want to press the pause button now and just spend a moment or so in prayer before we begin and, and, and ask the Lord uh, through his Holy Spirit, if he'll open your eyes the eyes and ears of your heart to his word. So you're not hearing my words, but you're hearing what he wants to say to you. So in part two, what I want to try to show to you, try to uh, demonstrate is that there's hope. God is over the situation and nothing takes him by surprise. Uh, now, just a little um, sort of technical thing. On some slides, you'll, you'll see those little um, markers with uh, references to future modules. So again, just to stress that um, even though probably today is going to be about probably three quarters of an hour, 50 minutes, something like that. Um, I'm leaving out most of the detail. The, the detail will be structured into the future modules in case you're wondering where, where that's going to come along. OK, so by now you should have been alerted to the dramatic shift of events um, in, the, in the world. And what I would like you to start doing now, this is almost like one of your first actions at coming out of Amiga really, is to start to search these kind of things out for yourself. Uh, again, ask the Lord to make you aware of what's happening. And again, there'll be dedicated training on this following in a few modules time, but I certainly would advise you not to use the mainstream media. Don't use, for example, if you're in the UK, don't use the BBC. Uh, don't use any of the main news channels because you won't hear truth on them. You'll, you'll, you'll hear a very sort of modified version of it. If you're in the United States, uh, CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, you can't trust them. So you need to start to determine what, what, what are reliable sources. So again, training will follow on that. Now, it's important that Christians don't get comfortable in the world. The world isn't our home. Um, and throughout history, uh, the Lord has turned up the heat through events uh, through various events that happen to um, start to separate the the true church from the world, from the world system, in the same way that he separates wheat from chaff, in the same way that uh, we separate uh, silver from, from from dross through through the application of heat. And it's also worth mentioning at this stage that God is absolutely sovereign. So 
God is over this situation. The Lord, we have to recognise, we have to acknowledge, has permitted trouble to come upon the earth. So again, one of the questions that we're going to be answering in, in Amiga is why, why has he done that? But in terms of the sovereignty of God, God does what he wants, when he wants, in the way he wants, and he asks nobody's permission. And our Lord, Jesus Christ, we know uh, through scripture, is the head of all rule and power and authority. Every CEO, every boss, every headmaster, uh, every head of government, every um, head of the armed forces, uh, the heads of all these media organisations, which wherever you sit in society, there will be some kind of chain of command where, where, where you fit in. And the fact is, is that Jesus is the head of all rule, power and authority. He is absolutely in control. Um, he allows, he permits, and he's got the whole thing absolutely covered. So as we look at part two, what we're going to get into is we're going to look at the purpose of prophecy briefly. Um, I'm going to ask this question, this big question, really, that uh, are Christians going to escape trouble? In other words, could the rapture happen today, tomorrow, next week? Uh, could it happen any time? Or actually, do we have to go through a season of trouble first uh, before he, he returns? And then, of course, the question that follows that then is, is if we are going to follow, uh, go into a season of trouble, is the church ready for that? OK, I'm then going to preview the modules uh, 1 to 10. OK, so we've got sort of 10 major chunks in terms of uh, Amiga. That breaks down into several other, um, several other sort of sub-modules, if you will. So we've probably got about 25 in total, something like that. Uh, and at the end, really, of, of this uh, part two, I'm going to ask you to make a decision as to whether you want to commit to the programme or not. So in my profession as a management trainer, um, I'm not exaggerating when I say I work with some of the world's most advanced, most complex, high value projects, uh, military projects and, and other kinds of projects in the nuclear industry too. And it's been my privilege to work with some of the finest, sharpest minds, both in industry and, and in the armed forces as well. Um, and I've learned along the way that um, the wisdom when I'm training uh, such people is always in the, the questions that I ask. And by the grace of God, he's given me a certain sort of measure of, of wisdom in this, a certain level of ability, which I never thought I would have. And I'm, I'm amazed that he put me where, where he put me, really. So throughout the Amiga program, uh, I'm going to extend to you um, the same standard of professionalism that I've, that I've given them through over 20 years of, of, of training such people. OK, so here are a few questions that uh, you might have uh, been considering as the world's been falling into chaos. Now, as if you're watching this as a, as a group, in a group situation, then maybe uh, at this stage you'd just like to pause the video, just wait till I get the questions up, pause the video and discuss these just for 10 or 15 minutes before you get on. So, so the first question then is, why does, why does a God... Why does a God of love allow trouble is, is a question that we're often asked, isn't it? Um, are, are things going to get better? Are they going to get worse? I mean, there's, as I speak now, in um, this, is, this is early uh, 2021, a lot of Americans are, are asking this question, really, that maybe, uh, uh, you know, you look at what um, the, uh, the Bede and Harris administration is doing and, and could Donald Trump come back and sort everything out and, you know... Post-COVID, is the world going to get back to normal? You know, so we, we, we just don't know. Well, according to uh, the, the media, we just don't know. Why do the wicked prosper? Why is it that uh, wicked people, why does the Lord allow them to prosper? Why do they just seem to get wealthier, more powerful? Why do their plans seem to succeed? Why do they have that smile on their face? Um, this question, which I've already asked, could Jesus come any time? So literally, could he come any time? Or are there certain events that need to take place before he will return to earth, as he said he will? Will the church escape trouble? OK, and another question there is, is how do we know that it will escape trouble? And the final question, I mean, there are lots of questions we could ask here. Um, and this is one that's been asked to me by um, a number of believers. Is, isn't there enough for the church to do now without worrying about all this sort of uh, future, all this eschatology stuff, all this end times prophecy? Um, so again, it's a fair it's a fair question. So I would hope by the end of this session, I won't have answered all those questions. By the end of Amiga, I will have answered every question, by the way, and a lot more besides. Okay, but there are just some just to be chewing on, just for the time being. So what I want to get into now, really, is the is the nature of prophecy. So I'm not going to get, go into an in depth. Um, a detailed view of this. I just want to stick to the headlines uh, at the moment. We, we, as I say, we will get more into this as, as, as we go forward with, with Amiga. But what is prophecy? Um, 
in this sort of rapidly changing world, can, can a Christian really know what lies ahead? And to what degree of detail can we know what lies ahead? How reliable and how relevant is Bible prophecy, which was written down um, you know, at its latest uh, 2,000 years ago, and many of the prophecies that we actually read would probably go back at least a couple of thousand years before that, so 4,000 years before now. And in my experience, I've been a believer now for nearly 50 years, most Christians only take a, a casual interest in prophecy, uh, although some are actually obsessed with it, I think we have to, we have to uh, acknowledge. So why does the Bible contain so much prophecy? And how should we interpret it? And where do we find it? OK, so we're going to take a look at this. Um, and as we get through this session today, there are going to be a number of scriptures that we're going to call up. So I, I'm encouraging you to, to, as the Holy Spirit prompts you, to memorise these scriptures. And the way you do that very simply is write them out on a card, um, stick it in your purse or your wallet, and just keep repeating them out loud until they stick. If you wake up in the night, try and, try and recall them. Start building the foundations now, uh, which are going to be necessary for end time living. And I promise you that if you're faithful in the small things, if you start as you mean to go on, then the rest will build from that. OK, so. And remember, the Amiga program is all about action. It's not about tickling your intellect. It's not about filling a notebook. It's not about, oh, that was just a great another series of you know, teaching. It isn't that interesting. Let's move on to the next one. Um, but Amiga is very much about equipping the saints for service, for works of service. And as we progress through the programme, the Holy Spirit is going to be prompting you and directing you into a specific role, a responsibility that only you can fulfil in the kingdom of God. And if you don't do it, that job's not going to get done. So the Lord is shaping us for end time service. Yeah. Um, and. Again, just before we get into this whole thing about prophecy, I, I just advise you, it's, it's just as important to understand what you're not responsible for as what you are. I remember years ago, um, uh, there was a certain uh, sort of well-meaning pastor who was trying to get me to lead worship with a guitar. I can play the guitar a little bit, but very badly. Um, but he was trying to encourage me into, in, 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 into playing the guitar so I could lead worship. And I, and I know I'm not called as a worship leader, as you would know if you've ever sat next to me when, I, when I've been singing. Um, but uh, the Lord has put my sort of gifting, my calling in different areas. OK, so let's get into this question then. What is what is prophecy? Well, essentially, prophecy has 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 two aspects. The first aspect is what we call forth telling, speaking out now, speaking the word of God to the current situation. So there's no sort of aspect of um, what's the word, you know, the future in this. We're not sort of trying to predict anything. This is just the Lord speaking right now into a situation to make his will and his word manifest. And of course, then the second aspect of prophecy um, is, is this whole area of prediction, um, where the Lord is speaking um, about a future time. Uh, and that future time could be tomorrow. It could be a thousand years from now. OK, so it's going to vary. And I love this verse from Amos, uh, chapter three, where the Lord says, if a trumpet is blown in the city, will not the people tremble? And if a calamity occurs in the city, has not the Lord done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. So this verse interestingly links uh, prophecy, uh, judgment and the secret counsel of the Lord. That is very pertinent to what's happening at the moment in the world. Um, and as we go through Amiga, I've got a dedicated module on the judgments of God, and you're going to be amazed uh, by the um, the way that the these judgments are even now happening upon the earth. Yeah, I'm convinced, for example, that COVID what was a judgment from God. Okay, but I'll I'll be explaining that as we as we go forward. And these uh, prophetic words are principally for His people to warn and to edify His people. Um, to uh, you know, for a, n a number of reasons we'll, we'll get into in the in the next sort of couple of slides or so. But also, more, more generally, I mean, you know, you can get into a situation like, say, with uh, Jonah and, and, and Nineveh, where it's actually more for the world. The Lord, sometimes in his grace and in his mercy, he will warn the world through this prophetic utterance. Um, interesting that uh, New Orleans was warned uh, several times by uh, Christian preachers, Christian prophets, before Hurricane Katrina uh, hit it uh, many years ago. So the purpose of prophecy. So simply and again we're not going to go into a lot of detail here but I just want to sort of put down almost like the four legs on the chair of a prophecy so 
For me, first of all, it's the, uh, it's the demonstration and the revelation of God's character. So it has to focus on God. Now compare that with a lot of prophecy here in church, which is very me-centric. It focuses on me and, and how God loves me and how the Lord's going to bless me. It's not focusing on him. So that, that, that's the first thing. So it focuses on his faithfulness, his holiness, his righteousness, his mercy, his anger, his love, all the, the words that describe his, his character. The second aspect of prophecy is basically to warn now, i.e. warn about something that's happening today, or to forewarn us, to, to let us know that something is coming along and we need, to, we need to take some kind of action. Maybe we need to repent. Maybe we need to prepare. You know, if you are Noah, then you need to build an ark, for example. So sin has its consequences, doesn't it? The third leg on the chair, then, of prophecy is to correct us. You know, we all, we're human. We have to recognise we are human. And the Lord, as believers, the Lord loved us. Uh, he sent his son to die for us at Calvary, didn't he? Um, but he hates the sin. He hates the sin in a Christian just as much as he hates the sin in in somebody in, in the world who, who who isn't a believer. So so he wants to correct us, and he will correct us. And we all we've all experienced that chastening, haven't we? And it's it can be very severe. And the fourth leg on the chair, the fourth uh, step, is is preparation. Really pre- preparing us for times ahead. So. I'm just going to share with you a very sort of powerful but simple technique, one that was shared with me um, many years ago, uh, um, which is how to recognise truth, yeah? How to recognise, how to discern truth from error. Um, and I was told this story um, where there was a, a certain um, man who worked in uh, in one of the banks and his job was actually to pick out the counterfeit notes, now, rather than going straight to the, the box of counterfeit notes or the questionable notes, or bank, bank notes, first thing in the morning, what he would do is he'd spend the first 20 minutes every morning taking a genuine bank note, let's say an English £5 note, and studying it and looking at it through different angles, looking at it through his, um, uh, his magnifying glass and really becoming familiar with it. And when he, then he started to look at the counterfeit notes, they, they simply jumped out at him. So if we're going to avoid deception in this age, where and, and major warnings on deception, of course, in the New Testament, uh, we need to be fully, um, what's the word, fully um, aware of what good looks like, of what, of what truth looks like. So Unfortunately, in the Christian life, there is no gift of discernment. There's a gift of discerning of spirits, but there's no gift of discernment to work out truth from error. It's, it's something, it's a quality which has to be developed in us. So we know that the Bible calls wisdom the principal thing. If you've heard my teaching on this before, you know, there are many, many scriptures that elevate wisdom above love in, in, in terms of um, uh, the, the qualities that a Christian can have. You know, the Bible says in, in Proverbs that wisdom is the principal thing and the Lord blessed Solomon because he cried out for wisdom. He cried out for a discerning heart. And Jesus is the truth, isn't he? And this takes time to develop. It's not a gift. It's a habit. It's, I don't know whether it's a skill, um, but it's certainly a quality that, that, that a Christian can develop over many, many years. And my observation, and you can take this or leave it, but I've got to say... Um, from my observation, there's a lot of false, a lot of soulish prophecy around today. Um, and it's not wicked. It's not intended to be misleading necessarily, but it comes out of a man's mind or his emotions, his soul, if you will. It's not born of the Holy Spirit acting upon his spirit. And I've got to say, and I hope this doesn't offend um, certainly the American believer, um, American listeners here, but I do question a lot of the prophecy that comes out of the American TV networks. Um, a lot of prophecy that's appearing on on websites, almost like you've got a prophet who who has to has to come up with a weekly prophecy. Um, and I'm sure they're sincere and well meant, but I think a lot of this is soulishness. I've got to say. So I'll give you a phrase now. We need to learn to discern. Learn to discern. Is it scriptural? Is it accurate? What's the fruit of it? Yeah. And in my lifetime, um, I've got to say, you know, if you look at uh, different kinds of uh, prophets, um, I would say. Um, David Wilkerson uh, was uh, an, an Ephesians 4 prophet um, with the, this whole sort of situation with America burning. If you're, if you're over in the UK, you, you, you may or may not have heard of a man called Alex Buchanan who, who um, basically prophesied very much about the fire of God's judgment falling onto the UK. David Pawson, who, um, who, who, who prophetically uh, spoke about the Islamization 
of the United Kingdom. These, for me, were Ephesians 4 prophets. Um, and if you look on our on the Amiga program website under the resources section, you'll find some examples of some of their prophecies and just weigh them and, and check those out. So I'm just going to give you an example of a modern day a modern day prophecy. And this goes back 20 years. This is um, in, in, in the year or so preceding uh, 9-11. And the location is the Times Square Church in New York. OK, so this is uh, 2001. And let's let me read this to you. Just prior to the striking of the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, God began to warn our congregation here in New York City. Around July of that year, our church services were marked by a profound soberness. There were times when we pastors couldn't preach and the choir couldn't sing. We couldn't even pray. We would all just sit in silence. Nobody wanted to get up because of the presence of the Lord was so strong. And all the while, the continuous thought in all of our hearts was that we were about to face some very, very difficult days in the city. People would be running in the streets terrified. We didn't know exactly why, but we knew that we needed to be prepared to minister to them. Of course, not everybody was willing to hear this message. There were perhaps a few hundred who concluded, we didn't come here for this, we came here to be blessed. We didn't come to hear what a great calamity is coming to the city. And so they left. But when the towers were struck, an incredible sense of strength and stability was found among those who stayed. People were ready to minister. They rolled up their sleeves and said, tell us what to do. We began to buy truckloads of water and food and we sent people out onto the streets and down to ground zero. You see, that to me is, is a wonderful example of a modern sort of prophetic movement within a church. Yeah. Now, if we look at false prophecy, false prophecy, and I've just tried, if you sort of read Jeremiah 23 in your own time and Ezekiel uh, 12 to 14, you'll get a picture of the, the Bible describing uh, false prophecy. Uh, but it's very me centric. It's, it's a very common trend of um, um, mo modern prophecies, a lot, a lot of soulless prophecies, that they tend to focus on me and who I am and making my life more comfortable and, and blessing me. Therefore, they tend to be very um, uh, popular. You know, people want to hear them. Um, it's it's very much a sense of I'm OK. God loves me um, just as I am. It's not like the fact that he sort of hates any sin in me, but he's, he, he's, 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 it's very much a sort of a work of, of false assurance in a lot of ways. It, it therefore can give a sense of false peace. Um, and of course, you've heard that scripture, you know, these shepherds who say peace, peace when there is no peace. False predictions as well. So, you know, we, we need to judge a, a prophet by the accuracy of their predictions. It, it tends to tolerate immorality, and there is immorality within the church. I mean, you know, we've, we, we've recently seen in the sort of newspaper headlines in 2021 about the major immorality within the, within the Hillsong movement, for example. Now, again, were people prophesying at that time during that, when that was going on? Was that picked up? Yeah, I've got to ask the question. Um, OK, self-exaltation, you know, building up personality ministries, uh, building up sort of big reputations and so forth. Um, you know, lots of book sales and, and, and book deals and things. And ultimately, these prophecies will be unscriptural. Now, true prophecy, the centre is very much on the Lord. Now, I've experienced true prophecy, I would say, probably maybe um, from an Ephesians 4 prophet, when, when I've personally been in the room, probably around about maybe four, maybe, may, maybe six, half a dozen times, something like that. And when the true prophet speaks, there is such a sense of the holiness of God that you feel utterly humbled, um, almost a sense of um, being ruined because you, you're so, so aware of your own um, human frailty uh, and sinfulness before his, before his holy character. So it's very much a, a manifestation of the presence of the holiness of God. There's a, there's a real strong, deep conviction it brings repentance. You'll see people weeping. You'll see people on their knees. You'll see people on their faces. There's a strong sense of uh, correction, um, a, a, a huge sense of God's righteousness. Um, it, 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 it propels us towards wanting to be obedient. Yeah, uh, There's a real godly authority. You know that this has come straight from the throne room of heaven. I remember hearing one of Alex Buchanan's prophecies at Spring Harvest. I think it was 1984. And it was it was just like we were, we were literally... Um, standing beneath an open heaven it, it was an awesome experience and I can remember it this day what are we now probably 40 years later um, just as clear as, as when it happened uh, true predictions and they, these these prophecies tend to be accurate 
Okay, so there, there is a difference and we need to learn to discern. We need to pray for that. So in the church, of course, we've got two aspects of this. We've got the Ephesians 4 prophet, i.e., you know, one of the fivefold ministry, you know, pastor, teacher, apostle, evangelist, uh, prophet. Um, and the Lord, I know, for example, has called me to be a teacher. And I've got a slightly prophetic aspect to that, but I'm not a prophet. You know, the Lord has not called me to be a prophet, but he certainly called me to join the dots of, of, of prophetic teaching in terms of in terms of scriptures. So that, that's the Ephesians 4 prophet. But as well as that, then we have the gift of prophecy. And, you know, we can we can cover the gift of prophecy. We, you know, the Lord tells us to pray for these gifts. So we, 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 we should pray for that gift of prophecy. So in terms of um, prophecy, uh, two sources really for the Christian. One is the Bible and the second one is the Holy Spirit. OK, and both will agree. They will witness. They will confirm. Uh, and you can use those lists on the previous page to help you sort of work out what is what. Yeah. So um, so let's just just first of all, look at the scale and accuracy of biblical prophecy. So if you actually add up um, J. Barton Payne produced his wonderful um encyclopedia of biblical prophecy it's the most comprehensive work you can buy and these copies aren't easy to find but uh, by the grace of god I've, I've got one um and literally he identifies every single prophecy in the bible and you can see there there's something like 1800 um, individual prophecies uh, in the old and new testament when you boil that down what that because some prophecies are talking about the same event that um it essentially defines 737 separate events yeah now that interestingly that is 27 percent of the bible if you actually add up all the verses in the bible and divide the number of prophecies um prophetic verses into that 27 percent of your bible so just over a quarter of your bible is prophetic so prophecy is important as christians we need to understand prophecy yeah and how many of these have been fulfilled you might ask um well it's amazing isn't it but 80 percent of those have been fulfilled to date 20% remain. Now, that doesn't mean that the Bible is 80% accurate. It is 100% accurate because the 20% still remain. Um, there are 332 predictions in the Old Testament to the incarnation of Jesus. Okay. And how many of those have been fulfilled? Well, of course, you know the answer to this. Um, and the answer is 100% of those have been fulfilled. He was the seed of Abraham. He was born of a virgin. He was the seed of woman. He was the son of God. He was the son of Jacob. He was a prophet like Moses. He pre-existed. Yeah, he was born in Bethlehem. So, of course, there are um, other sources of predictions as well today, aren't there? You know, that uh, people turn to. There are politicians who are always making prediction, uh, predictions, aren't there? There are economists who are making predictions about where, where our economy is going. You know, there are various experts. The, uh, the newspapers and, uh, and websites are full of experts making predictions about what the future holds. The media loves making predictions. Um, academia, the universities and, you know, sort of various sort of lobby groups and specialist um, sort of agencies are, uh, lo love making predictions as well. So that's on the sort of natural side of things. Um, on the occult side, so when I define the occult, what I'm talking about uh, very simply is any source of supernatural power or knowledge that is not from the Holy Spirit or from the Word of God, yeah? And that is, that, that is the occult. So that would include, for example, the use of tarot cards, uh, palm reading, um, horoscopes, people who consult mediums, and a whole load of other sort of new agey type stuff as well as, as well in there. So, so there are many other um, predictions, yeah? So it's... And generally speaking, I, I've sort of heard um, figures in the past that, uh, you know, with, with, with the occult, there, there, is a grain of, there is a grain of truth in there because otherwise wh wh how on earth would people uh, um, be, be sort of fooled by it? If it was always wrong, people would show no interest. So a bit like, um, I don't know if you ever looked at the, uh, the ingredients um, uh, of, a, um, of rat poison or mouse bait. It is something like 99.9% .9 good grain. But the but the point one percent is the poison, and it's the poison that kills us. So there's always a grain of truth with a, you know with having your palm read or with occult or or tarot or something like that. Okay, so now again, I don't say that to recommend it. I say that to warn you because the devil is a deceiver. He's a deceiver, and he wants to deceive you. And we are warned very strongly against um, getting involved in the occult or consulting. And, and if you've been involved in that, then you you will need some ministry to to free you from that. I mean, I spent. Um, you know, back to the um, you know account of the the, the bank manager or the, the bank individual who's studying the banknotes. You know, studying the, the the real thing, trying to understand what what good looks like. I spent th three years quite recently studying the Psalms, and the Lord just took me deeper and deeper and deeper. 
um, and just opened it up to me really. And and the Holy Spirit gave me a three year masterclass showing. I mean, I, I've read Psalms almost at, you know every um, you know r- right the way through my through my years as a Christian. But he took he took me so deeply into this. Um, and you know, in Psalm forty, uh, it says, "Behold, in the scroll of the book, it is written of me," which is basically speaking of Jesus of Messiah. Um, and you know what? Um, I think roughly ten percent of the Psalms are predictive, pointing to a future event. And that, that's just one book in the Bible. Um, and Jesus says, "When He, the Spirit of Truth, comes, He will disclose to you what is to come, to inform us, to alert us, to allow us to prepare, and to allow us to take action." So. The takeaway from this slide is that we can rely on the Bible. The Bible is very is the Bible is more up to date, more relevant than your than your newspaper, than your website, than the current news stations that you might be watching. And if we do have any you know, sort of kind of occult influence in our lives or books like that, we need to get rid of them. We need we need to get them out of our life. So just another what I call the principles of the prophetic. So there you're looking at a, a view um, and it's looking across what probably three or four different mountain ranges. And you can see there's a there's a mountain there on the in the sort of distance with something in the middle ground, and there's probably, or maybe even sort of you know half a dozen sort of peaks in between where we are and where it is, yeah. And this is what I want to call the uh, the depth of field principle. So if I just get my sort of pointer up, you know, imagine we're sort of here and we're we're looking over those mountains. That's our vantage point, and often in prophecy. Um, uh, a, a prophecy will actually give um, a, a number of predictions which combine what's going to happen in the near future with what's going to happen in the uh, distant future. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just turn quickly to Isaiah 9 and 6 to 7. So Isaiah 9 and 6 to 7, which basically talk about um, Messiah's coming, and they're very familiar verses that, that you will know. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over all his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So what we've got here is a situation where in verse 6, unto us a son is born. We know when that took place, don't we? Um, you know, and on sort of current calendars, that, that's reckoned to be around about 4 BC. But also there it talks about the Lord coming into um, an earthly government. And also it talks about the increase, the increase of his kingdom sort of uh, have, having no end, which is talking about eternity future. So the point is, within that verse, there are a number of, in terms of the chronology, there's a, there's a short term, um, what's the word? confirmation of, of that prophecy but there's also a long-term confirmation of that prophecy so we also need to be aware in uh, when we look at prophecy that sometimes buried just within one verse just within a few words of each other there could be many thousands of years of difference actually so we need to be aware of that when we when we study scripture okay now Moses describes the greatest prophet of all doesn't he the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. The Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up a prophet from among all their countrymen like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Now we know that that prophet like Moses was Jesus. And in John chapter 5, Jesus says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for Moses wrote about me. And that's where. So, This is so important. Jesus is the most important prophet. Now, if Jesus is the most important prophet, we then need to ask ourselves, what were Jesus' most important prophecies that he gave to us? And what we're going to see as we get into Omega is uh, two things. The first one is the prophecy of the spine, which, so this is... um, the day before Jesus is arrested and taken away for crucifixion, he gives a, a prophetic masterclass, the foundational cornerstone teaching for the great end time events. Yeah. Um, what's the second, what's Jesus' second most important and lengthy prophecy? Well, if you've read the book of Revelation, and I hope you have, because there's a blessing associated with it, you'll find that's Jesus' second great prophetic discourse. So logically, doesn't it make sense that if you want to understand end time prophecy, that this is where you start? 
you don't you don't start with a verse out of 2 Thessalonians or you don't start with a verse out of Ephesians or you don't start with a random verse out of Ezekiel you start with the most important prophet prophet and his most important prophecies so that's essentially where we're going to go where we're going to go with um with the Amiga program and these are just a few, uh, just a small examples of many scripture references that you don't often hear in church. You know, you won't find them on your um, Christian verse a day calendar. You won't find them in, in your promise box. But essentially, the normal Christian life is that in the world we'll have trouble, that the world's going to hate us because it hated Jesus before it hated us. But Jesus says that if you endure to the end, you're going to be saved. Yeah, that's the normal Christian life. And in Revelation 22, Jesus says, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book for the time is near. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy still be filthy. Let the one who is righteous still practice righteousness. Let the one who is holy keep himself holy. Jesus says, I'm coming quickly. My reward's with me to render every man to every man according to what he's done. And he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. Now, these little um, graphics on the right hand side here, I've got the Alpha course. Some of you uh, listening to this might have come to Christ through the Alpha course and it's done a pretty good job uh, over the years, hasn't it? Um, in terms of uh, introducing unbelievers into the, in, into the kingdom of God. But of course, the Alpha course is just the first step. Now, let's be honest. Um, how many of you have ever done a, a foundational um course in, in in christian doctrine since you first came into the kingdom how many have actually put let's say several weeks of study into that now i know in america particularly the american churches are are, are much better at that than say we are here in the in, in the united kingdom um so so there is a structure i personally would recommend this if you've never done this before there's something called the self-study bible course which was written by Derek prince many years ago and my wife is an evangelist. She's led many people to the Lord. And we've noticed over the years that those um, people who became Christians and did this foundation course, generally speaking, have gone on with God. Those who became a Christian but didn't complete the foundation course have generally struggled and often have fallen away. So that's just an observation. But the point is, is that we've got almost like an entry gate for the kingdom of God with things like the Alpha Course. We've got um, various training in um, um, sort of foundational Christian principles. But what the Lord showed me was that there wasn't really anything out there that I was aware of, which basically would train and equip believers to stand in the last days, almost like to complete complete the journey, really. So again, you might, if you're watching this in the group situation, you may just want to pause the um, message here and just have a bit of a chat there about how people came into the kingdom of God, how many of you have actually completed a foundational Christian um, doctrine course? For example, how many of you can recite the Hebrews 6 doctrines? You know, if I was to ask you that now, how many of you could actually answer that question? How many, how many of you could offer an explanation? How many of you could write half a page on each of those doctrines around baptisms and repentance and judgment and so forth? How many of you would know that? You see, this is basics. This is basic stuff. And if you're going to be an end time survivor, you've got to know the basics, yeah? OK, so so we'll move we'll move on. And the big question now is um, basically, are we going to escape or are we going to endure? Now, we've got to address a fundamental question. Um, there's a, a difference of opinion here, obviously, um, because the vast majority of the church at the moment, particularly the evangelical charismatic movement in the United States and the vast majority of the church in the UK, probably Australia, too, they hold this great escape view, but they can't give a particular reason why many um, people got it from a book uh, a song you know I was greatly influenced by the by the singing of Larry Norman I wish we'd all been ready back in the 1970s uh, the Barry Smith videos I listened avid, avidly to those um, you know I read the Hal Lindsey books from cover to cover many many times over um, I watched the film A Thief in the Night back in the 1970s so I'm showing my age there um, but you've got things like the Left Behind series now you know literally sold millions and millions of copies in the United States and these, of course, have influenced many, many people. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask you a key question now. And I want you to be really honest ab about this. If that is the view that you currently hold, um, 
Did you come to that purely through a study of scripture alone without any outside interference? Let me ask that question slightly differently. If you'd never read that book, if you'd never read, let's say, Left Behind or The Late Great Planet Earth or seen, you know, the, the Left Behind film, you'd never done that. Would you have come to the great escape position by yourself, i.e. this idea? And what I mean by the great escape position is that we could literally be raptured at any moment and that Christians will escape trouble. So would you have come to that view by yourself? Again, I want you to you maybe pause the, the message here and, and ask that question. The view that I hold and the view that um, you'll, you'll hear on Amiga um, is that I believe we've got to endure to the end. I believe there is serious trouble ahead. Now, let me explain why that is. So those, and I'm just going to be brief here, but I've done my best to summarise the arguments for those who believe there's going to be a great escape. So the great escape view is the most popular view today. OK, but of course, logically, popularity is no basis for accuracy. You know, sheep tend to follow the crowd, don't they? Would, would be one example of that. <clears throat> Secondly, why would the church be subject to the wrath of God? This is, this is an argument you hear an awful lot. But what I've observed over my life as a Christian is that God doesn't take me out of trouble, but he, he shepherds me through it. Yeah? Um, and if you study the lives of Christian um, men or you, know, you look at you know, the likes of, you know, the, let's say, Charles Wesley, for example, look at the, the trouble that he had to endure. Look at you know, those who opposed the slave trade, the Christians who opposed the slave trade, the trouble they had to endure. Look at the life of Moses or Abraham or David. David hiding in a cave from King Saul who wants to kill him. Yeah? God takes them not out of trouble, but he takes them through it. Um, so for me, suffering and endurance is the normal Christian life. And why should the West deserve special treatment? So again, we've talked a little bit about the suffering church, about the persecuted church in you know, places like Pakistan or Iran or China or so forth. But, you know, the West has got off easy at the moment. And I think we Americans are now beginning to understand that, you know, with, with the rise of the Bede and Harris administration, that, that suffering is coming to America. It's, it's going to come. OK, some uh, believers say there are going to be two comings. OK, so the first... Um, so if you hold the great escape view, this is this will be what you what you adhere to. That the first is for his saints, i.e., he's going to come back and fetch the saints up to heaven, and then the second is or his third coming, if you like. Then is then going to be he's he's going to come back with his saints right at the end of of uh, of, of almost like the the age in 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 terms of the earth and and wind up um, earthly history. So the first time he's going to come is for, the second time he's going to come is with. Um, but I would hold um, that the, these events are actually concurrent. OK, and, and again, I'll explain why as, as we get over the, ne the next modules. Um, and the spine of B B Bible prophecy, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark th 13, it's absolutely clear that Jesus comes only once. OK, so remember the greatest prophet and his greatest primary prophecy on the end times is the spine of biblical prophecy. It's where we must start. Also, there's no single verse or passage of scripture which advises two comings. Okay, uh, Christ's coming will be a complete surprise. Well, the surprise I believe will actually be for the unsaved, the thief in the night. You know the uh, the thing that's often often quoted. And of course, Jesus, in his uh, when he's describing end time events, he, he says when all these things start to take place, you know the earthquakes and the moon turning to blood and. The, uh, you know, the, the sun turning to blood and all these sort of great signs. He, he says, look up. OK, so it's not going to be a surprise. You know, there are people clearly there who need that warning and are, and are, and are going to be able to act upon it. Christ could come at any moment, again, is the belief of the great escape movement. OK, but in that case, take yourself back to the date of the early church. How could the church take the gospel to the whole earth? Well, it, it couldn't possibly if Christ could, could have come at any moment because the majority of earth wouldn't, w majority of people on earth would not have heard that message. And also Jesus inferred in many of his parables that he would be a long time coming. You know, you look at the master, the, the, the parables of the, of the master and the stewards, for example. Yeah. And Paul told the Thessalonians very clearly that Jesus wouldn't come until Antichrist had appeared. Um, and again, the spine places Jesus coming after the trouble. OK, passages describing the Great Tribulation omit the word church, OK, is one example. Um, but to counter that, no passage describing the rapture includes the church. And, you know, if you talk to an archaeologist, they will come up with a statement where they'll say that absence of evidence uh, does not indicate um, evidence of absence. In other words, if you can't find something, it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. It just means that you haven't found it, yeah? 
there's no difference in language. So again, I'm not going to get too technical, but things like Perusia, Epiphania, uh, the Saints, the Day of Christ versus the Day of the Lord. Okay, so so again, people holding the Great Escape view often will start here. So they're not starting in the spine; they're starting from here, and they're starting to use these words to justify their position. And of course, the saints is a generic term meaning holy ones. It can be used for both church and Israel. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2.8 uses Epiphania and Perusia to describe the same event, for example. Yeah. OK. And the day of Christ and the day of the Lord, to my view, anyway, are, are certainly interchangeable. And Israel, you know, so people hold the great escape view, just assume that God's going to sort of, you know, cast off Israel and just leave them to go through the trouble by itself. Now, that's that's not the kind of God that I understand. So that's the that's the great escape view. Now, the trouble ahead view. um, Okay, so those people like me who say actually the church is going to have to go through a season of trouble. um, Well, the fact is there is no explicit verse or passage to substantiate two comings or the great escape. That's a fact. The second fact, that pressure is rapidly increasing on the Western church. So again, I've got to say, um, and I'll, I'll be quite blunt, and I'm sorry if I offend my American um, brothers and sisters here, but I've got to say the American church is the least prepared for trouble because, brothers and sisters, you've had it so good for so many years, you know, so much prosperity, so much teaching, so many blessings. You know, it's been it's been very, very good and, and, and things have suddenly and shockingly changed. And I imagine, you know, many American uh, Christians at the moment are absolutely reeling through what's happened and through, I think, a failure to prepare for the fact that trouble was going to come. And the fact is Christians are persecuted in over 90 percent of the nations. OK, there are more Christian martyred, mar- Christians martyred in the 20th century than all the previous centuries combined. Jesus clearly warned us about trouble to come. I've already shown you a few verses. We'll get into more of those. Okay. And Jesus promised us a cross. Didn't promise us a cushion. Didn't promise us a cruise liner. Okay. The church has been persecuted now and throughout history. Again, history sort of records that. So why should, again, why should God favour Christians in the West? Um, The early church expected to face trouble and not escape. And I've given you there a whole list of... um, a whole list of um, sort of characters, including the the apostles themselves. I think only one of whom, if, from memory, died died of old age. All the rest were martyred. But uh, you know, you can study that list there and look up their writings, and they they basically expected trouble. Um, before eighteen thirty, uh, Jay and Darby, there was very um, little evidence for the Great Escape view. You know, you, 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 you've you got to really sort of look hard to find anything at all. I won't say there's none, but there's, there is virtually none. Uh, and the great escape view requires you to literally take your scissors to the Bible and take a verse from Ezekiel and a verse from 2 Thessalonians and a verse from here and a verse from there and piece it together. Whereas if you take the view that trouble Christians have to go through trouble then you just simply sit down and open up the spine of biblical prophecy in Matthew 24 or Luke 21 or Mark 13 and just read it through and it gives you a program couldn't be simpler yeah okay so so we'll get into those in the later modules but the bottom line is, I mean I'm not going to fall out with anybody I, I certainly wouldn't break fellowship with anyone who saw it differently but time time will tell um, and again I've trained thousands of people in risk management over the last 20 odd years uh, and, you know, risk is simply a future event which, if it occurs, is going to have severe consequences. So the first stage that we've got to do in any risk, talk to any risk management trainer and they'll tell you you've got to identify all those risks, make a list of them. You've got to assess them in terms of the ones that are going to have the most impact on you and the ones that are most likely to happen to you. And then you've got to take some kind of uh, intervention, some kind of action. And simply, without getting too technical, you either mitigate, in other words, you do something to stop that risk happening, or you put some kind of contingency plan in place, a fallback plan if you like if it occurs yeah so a bit like having a spare tire in your car in case in in case you get a puncture now that's really what Amiga is all about so simply stated let's sort of move on from this now but just with this thought if those who expect trouble ahead are wrong the only risk is that they'll be over prepared that's the only risk but if you adhere to the great escape view and you're wrong you simply won't be ready and again, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat this. The U.S. church is, is almost certainly the least prepared for this. 
you won't have oil in your lamp, neither be trimmed nor ready. And Jesus warns of, secure, of, of severe consequences for those who, who, who were not ready when, when that season came. OK, so Corrie Ten Boom. OK, so this is Corrie Ten Boom. I had a real, she was the lady who went through the, um, the concentration camp. I think it was Ravensbrook. Her sister died there. And she had a, a tremendous ministry, part of which was preparing the church for trouble. And she was talking to um, a Chinese bishop. And this is the, the story. She says that in China, the Christians were told, don't worry, before the tribulation comes, you'll be translated, raptured. And by the way, they were told that by American evangelists. Then came a terrible persecution. Millions of Christians were tortured to death. Later, I heard a bishop from China say, sadly, we failed. We should have made the people strong for persecution rather than telling them that Jesus would come first. Tell the people how to be strong in times of persecution, how to stand when the tribulation comes, to stand and not to faint. Now, the reality is that, I mean, just, just this week, I just did a little bit of research on this, just to sort of confirm that the, the latest view. That, but Breitbart News, which is one of my sort of trusted news sources, reported that over 340 million Christians today in 2020, uh, that's one in eight, are already under severe persecution based on the Open Doors watch list. And at the very least, and again, this depends on how you measure it, there was something in the order of 4,700 killed, 4,300 arrested without trial and imprisoned. Um, and by the way, to that, you can add a, a, a Canadian pastor, can't you, in 2021, been all over the news, hasn't it? Uh, but again, it depends how you measure these things. If you include all those who are killed simply because they were Christian, i.e. not active Christians who are sort of active in an, uh, an active witness or minister or something like that, you can certainly get above 100,000 uh, Christians who are being killed a year. Now, I'm going to get more into that in Module 5.2. And Christian suffering is more than any other religion. We need to understand that, yeah? So it's really sort of coming to the time where you sort of got to start thinking about making your mind up um so which seems more logical which seems more just which seems more scriptural the great escape view or enduring to the end okay so please prayerfully consider this please open your mind to what the holy spirit is saying to you um and everything now that follows is based on is based on that decision so the reality check so just look in the mirror for a sec Ask yourself, why should the West, West escape trouble? Are you ready? Are you really ready? Are you really certain about what's to come? Do you honestly know what the Bible has to say about the, the last days? And do you understand how you should be preparing? So again, at this stage, feel free if you're, in a, if you're in a house group situation, pause the video and just talk about that. So just before we sort of conclude and i show you what what, uh, what what lies ahead on Amiga. I just want to talk a little bit about the genesis of Amiga, my story. So I thought it might just help a few of you. Um, I got interested in end-time prophecy in the 1970s. I was born again in November 1973. Um, uh, I'd always read up on it, uh, even as a young believer, uh, with things like the Hal Lindsey books. And I got into uh, the teaching of uh, Pastor Chuck Smith from Costa Mesa in California in the 1980s. Um, so listen to that. Um, and I think I was very much of the view at that stage that Jesus could come any moment, you know, and, and everyone was everyone was sort of, you know, trying to sort of get ready for the imminent return of Jesus. This is back in the sort of mid mid to late 1970s. And then I came across a series of teaching by David Pawson, uh, uh, Head in the Cloud. And this was in the late 1980s. And it really shook up my thinking. It made me think and it wanted me just to check out for myself. So I decided to research and study this whole subject in depth. So this is sort of late 1980s now, and I spent a long time in Matthew 24, Luke 31, Mark 13, and Revelation. Printed them all off on my computer, I laid them on the floor, I coloured them in, put them down in parallel, um, like I say, colour-coded them. I started looking for patterns, for milestones, for chronologies, the meaning of the Greek words. And then, um, so that was sort of soaking away in, 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 in my spirit, really, you know, dividing soul and spirit. And then um, I was fortunate enough to uh, hear uh, Derek Prince, uh, uh, who, who for me is probably the premier Bible teacher of this age, of certainly of my lifetime, in 1988 at the Malvern Bible Week, which was the most authoritative teaching I'd actually heard on this subject. And he really started to open up the scriptures 
there. And again, it just challenged my thinking. So as a result of that, at this time, I was, I was leading a small fellowship up, up, up in the northwest of England. And I, and I put together a series of teaching, which I call Seven Phases to the End of the Age. That was in the early 1990s. Now, much earlier in my Christian life, uh, probably around about uh, um, probably 1979, 80, something like that, I'd been along to a, a, a meeting in Blackpool, England, when the uh, American prophetess Jean Darnell had been speaking. And she walked through a whole crowd of people um, and put a hand on my head and, and prophesied over me that the Lord would um, cause me to lead many people to him and, and I would be a great strength to my brothers and sisters. And I've always associated that prophecy with, 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 with this ministry. So in late sort of 2010 now, just move, moving, the, moving the sort of time on, um, I went into a really in-depth study of Revelation. I, again, I downloaded it. I sort of um, formatted it. You can download it off the website under the resources section if you want to see that study. Just because I really wanted to understand Revelation and understand it deeper, more deeply how it, how it related to the, um, uh, the events of the spine. OK, but the Holy Spirit, as so often I find with this, the Holy Spirit prompts me and says, why stop there? So I just kept on researching and kept on researching. Now, remember, by profession, I trained some of the finest minds in the world to build chronologies, to manage complex military projects like nuclear submarines, for example, by their life cycle. Um, and I'm acknowledged by God's grace to be a global leader in this field. And, and I'm not exaggerating when I say I've trained more people across more projects in more countries uh, over the last 20 years than probably anybody else uh, in this particular field. So this is my profession, this is my discipline, and I applied that thinking. Um, also, by the way, I'm trained as a practitioner in logical thinking. I applied that discipline um, to this whole sort of topic, um, and I eventually thought, I'd, you know, I'd, 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 if I can't buy the book I want that's going to tell me all this, because I literally couldn't find a book that was that was describing this to me, so I decided to write one myself. And it took me five years, and that's really how End Time Survivor came about. So that's my sort of, uh, that's the genesis of End Time Survivor. Okay, so when I was writing End Time Survivor, I came to three, um, three conclusions, really. So number one, that the world situation is going to get rapidly and significantly worse, then suddenly and wonderfully better. Number two, the Western church is badly prepared and misinformed for the trouble ahead. I, I can't think of a, a single church in my country which has done any kind of preparation at all for what's happening. I'm only aware, by the way, of one church in America, and I think that's Mike Bickle's church, uh, which has actually done anything towards this. There, there may be others, so please forgive me if I'm missing you out, but uh, it's, it's, it's certainly not a priority. And thirdly, we urgently need specific and effective training to prepare ourselves for what's already here, and what's coming and again to my american brothers and sisters the 2020 uh, u.s presidential election results should be acting as a wake-up call for you for this and again if covid19 uh, i'm speaking to all believers here covid19 took you by surprise then simply you aren't ready you are not ready so the objectives of the amiga program what can amiga offer you uh, let's get into that shall we it's there's an urgent need uh, to ask yourself if you think you are presently equipped to deal with the present world state. Um, and if I had to sort of, sort of sum it up, I'd say um, I'd describe an end time survivor as a believer with a combination of a cross-centred, spirit-led life and a solid understanding of scripture. So firstly, what, this, what Amiga will offer you, it will give you an understanding of the big picture of end time prophecy. It's going to show you... Um, uh, educate you really how to look for and interpret the signs of the times not as straightforward as you might think it's going to begin to prepare for the trouble ahead it's going to help you to understand your role and responsibility to invest in the kingdom of god and you have one one day you will stand before the blazing eyes of jesus and he's going to he's going to ask you for a, an account as to what he called you to do and what you did about it make sure you're prepared for that day and finally um, it will help you to look forward to the future with joy and hope and faith not any fear of the future but a real sense of joy and strength yeah so let's get into it then so I'm going to be brief here I, again I could spend a lot of time on this but um, time is pressing on and I promise to try to keep this as, as short as I could so again apologies for overrunning slightly this is the uh, the second iteration of Amiga the first iteration ran um, sort of five or six years ago 
um, and I've now significantly updated and expanded the, the the content of Amiga. It's quite unique. I don't believe you'll find any find this on any Bible College uh, prospectus. And every module has actions. It's got memory verses, and it's going to focus on what I call world class basics, kingdom principles. You know that would please Jesus. So you've hopefully already seen the short sort of ten minute prime of the Amiga preview video. Uh, module zero, the gateway, is where we are now, which is just an introduction and an overview. What follows next, then, is the spine of biblical prophecy, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13, where I'm going to lay those out for you, and we're going to establish a clear pattern. Now, a spine is what you build a skeleton uh, onto. You put the skull on, you put the arms on, you put the legs on, and, and you've got a body, but you always start with the spine. Following on from that, then, Revelation. So the spine was Jesus' primary, most important prophecy that he gave the day before he was um, crucified. The revelation then, of course, then is, the, is which, which, which comes a number of years later, to, you know, through John on the Isle of Patmos, um, is, is essentially um, a, a handbook for the end times. And it's packed full of information, packed full of warnings and advice and, and chronologies and so forth. But how does it link to the spine? Well, I'll show you in that uh, key to revelation. Number three, the gathering storm. So we've covered some of this ground so far, but the signs of the times, how are we going to read those? How are we going to assess them? So I've broken that down into a number of um, smaller modules. Module 3.1 is basically the role of the watchman, how we can use the media, how we can uh, assess sources for accuracy, for reliability, the how we can filter out misinformation, how we can assess all that. Uh, what I call low information Christians, low information Christians who are Christians who just sort of cruise along without any kind of awareness of these major issues that are going on. It's like there's a war raging, but their earplugs are in and they just can't hear it, they can't see it. And again, it's about learning to discern. Module 3.2, the emerging global religion. We've touched on it, but this whole thing about humanism, political correctness, the World Economic Forum, and the role of big tech in all that and, and some other issues as well. Module 3.3 is where I'm going to focus on UK anti-Christian legislation about how the, the UK law since uh, the, uh, the Blair years of 1997 and through Cameron and so forth have started to criminalise Christians. Boris Johnson is building on this, yeah? And module 3.4 is basically where I'd like to produce other modules uh, which, for example, show a similar situation with the legislation in America, Australia, Canada, wherever. And I'm again, this is a message to any lawyers uh, from those nations who are listening out. I, I, I could do with maybe some help from you just to sort of come up with something on that that's that's fairly brief and pertinent and accurate so, so we can get that up and use that to educate people. Module four then, OK, we've not talked much about Israel, but Israel is central to the plans of the Lord in the end times. And I've called that chosen people, promised land. The first module, OK, is going to deal with the origin and history um, of um, of Israel and look, for example, at the temples, the Palestinian issue, the land and the covenants and so forth, the Holocaust. The second module, 4.2, looks at the relationship between Israel and the church. So things like chronologies, replacement theology, antisemitism, the media and our, our responsibility as Christians to, to the Jewish people. Module five, then, War on the Saints. OK, so here we're going to look at the four beasts of Daniel 7 and the third temple. If you've listened to my prophetic updates, you'll already be to a certain degree familiar with those four beasts. But we're going to look at the, the third temple in, in, in Jerusalem and, and how that's going to come about and the, the end time landscape that, that goes with that. We're going to look then at the Antichrist in uh, module 5.2, the Antichrist and the tribulation, the four stages of the tribulation, the purpose of the tribulation. Why, why would the Lord allow his chosen people to go through tribulation? What's the purpose? What about the persecuted church? What about the role of the overcomer? Module six, then, what I call geography and judgment. OK, so this is why, when, how and who God judges. So. Um, tough questions you know how can a god of love allow you know children to suffer how can a god of love allow trouble why do the wicked prosper i will answer all those questions in that module um, and how it applies to three groups of people three types of judgment and we'll consider there the anger and the mercy of god in the second module 6.2 we'll look at spiritual geography we'll look at the eternal destinations heaven and hell you know, we'll look at all these different places like Gehenna and Hades and, 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 and so forth and paradise. And we'll, we'll explain how, how all that works together in the perfect plan of God. Module seven, thy kingdom come. So this is the first of three major modules on thy kingdom come. And the first one essentially deals with the return of Christ, 
OK, so what, why is he coming back? What's he going to do when he comes back? Where is he going to come back? And when is he going to come back? Is it really the second coming? Um, or actually, has Jesus been to earth many times before? OK, so we, we'll, we'll, we'll unpack that for you. Uh, we'll look at the great separation of uh, sheep, sheep and, uh, and goats and so forth. That's in module 7.1. In 7.2, we'll look at the seven stages of Christ's return. We'll look at the role of Babylon. What is Babylon? The wrath of God. Um, we'll look at retribution. We'll look at, the, uh, we'll look at Israel in that module as well. The second Thy Kingdom Come module, which it looks at this thing called the millennium. This is the thousand-year earth reign of Jesus once he's returned. And it starts with a post-apocalyptic clear-up, very graphically described in, in your Bible. The restoration of Israel, the geographical upheaval, and the, and the building of a new temple. The second um, uh, module there, 8.2, which, uh, which looks at the restoration of God's people, new bodies and a place prepared, Gog and Magog, the fruit of suffering, righteous government, the marriage supper of the Lamb, all, all wonderful, exciting stuff. And the third uh, module of Amiga, Thy Kingdom Come 3, is eternity future, forever and ever. This is the, uh, when the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven like a bride and that uh, the whole of the, of, of the earth and the, uh, the, the heavens are consumed with, with fire. And finally, we get to meet the Father, the price having been paid and the word of work of reconciliation being done. And then the final module for Amiga then is uh, what I call end time survivor. So this is ready, willing and able. This is a very sort of practical module, really, of um, I, I guess just sort of underlining everything, pulling it all together. But the practical response as to what we need to do now in every single module, I'm going to try to give you those practicalities because I don't want to keep you waiting to the end. But it's the fact we all have a personal faith story. We need to balance, don't we, through this hope versus fear, um, you know, and, and, and fear of God, not fear of the future. We have a personal cross. There are seven lessons there that Jesus gave us specifically that we need to focus on as we as we um, focus on the end times. OK, so that's that's just a very quick overview of the program. Now, Richard Vernbrand. Um, so I'm just coming to a, con a, con a conclusion now. Um, so just an observation. Many right wing commentators, many Christian commentators even just point out the problems and just complain about it. You just watch Fox News for an hour, for example, and, and, and that's the kind of thing you'll see. And it doesn't, it's interesting, but it doesn't help. And it can sometimes leave you with a feeling of despair. But we have a choice. Now, Richard Vernbrand, I don't know if maybe some of the younger believers won't have come across him, but um, he was um, basically, uh, he, 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 he came from uh, Romania un, un, under the communists and was basically in prison for, for, for many, many years. And he said, in suffering, you can become bitter or you can become better. And when he was arrested by the communists, Vernbrand uh, smiled. And, he, uh, and when he smiled, his captors became frightened. And they said, why, why are you smiling? And he said, because of the promises I have. He said, Jesus told us we don't have to fear and he keeps his word. Now, please don't think this can't happen in the West. Look at Canada right now, where a, a, a pastor has been imprisoned, where a church has been um, fenced off, uh, where, you know, 100 paramil pa paramilitary policemen are basically stopping that fellowship from meeting where every day across the West we are seeing incidents like this. It's happening right now, my, my brothers and sisters. So, and it's taken just 20 years here in the UK for Christians to be arrested, criminalised, driven from public life and witness. And it's going to get worse before it gets better. <clears throat> but there are over 100 fear not verses in your Bibles. So, counting the cost. Okay, so... Time is short, so I'm going to leave you to read this yourself. There is a price to pay for the decision to commit to Amiga. It's a serious commitment. It's going to take your time, your energy. It's going to change you and your lifestyle. You've got to ask yourself, is it a price worth paying? And I'd like you to read that um, passage from Luke 14 but about calculating the cost. I'd also like you to read Daniel 10 as well, where Daniel gets a vision of the future. And literally, he just um, he's trembling. He's, 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 he goes white. Um, he has, his natural colour and his strength left him. And the angel has to physically strengthen him. And now the angels are going to do that for us, my brothers and sisters. They're going to bless us in that way. So again, take time to meditate, please, on these passages. So it's a long journey. It's, I'd be realistic, it's going to take you between a year and two years to complete and to work through this. It's just like, um, imagine a specialist training programme for the military special forces. 
you know, the American Navy SEALs or the, the UK Special Air Service, for example. Because what I'd like to do is to take you from a novice in this to being what I call a practitioner, or very simply, as Jesus would describe, a disciple. Okay, I'm literally going to take you with Amiga from eternity past to eternity future. I'm going to give you a better understanding of that than, you, than you've ever had. By the grace of God, we will experience the heights of heaven, but we will also get a taste of the depths of hell as well. I'll be moving fast. Um, I won't always be going verse by verse. I want to show you the big picture. I want to give you a, a framework. So I'm relying on you to be disciplined, to study, to put the hard yards in, checking and confirming what I'm talking about. Uh, and of course, the beauty of video is that you can pause, you can reflect, you can repeat as often as you want to. Uh, the handbook is your Bible. Absolutely. Uh, and this is going to take you into corners of your Bible you've never you've never been into before. And it's going to show you how scripture is, is scripture can't be broken. It's wonderfully in, 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 and divinely interconnected. Yeah. Uh, so I just say there, get yourself a decent translation. If you've got the message, stick it in the bin, get yourself a decent translation like the New King James Version or the NIV, uh, for example. Uh, New American Standard Bible is also very good. Uh, End Time Survivor um, is, 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 is my work. So if you want to buy a copy of that, then you can do. And again, I, I, I'm just making the offer that if, if you are um, a believer in the um, any of the top 50 um, open doors watch list countries, if you're part of that persecuted church, then I will send you, um, if you contact me via the website, I will send you a, a free copy of the Kindle version. OK, but for the rest of us, if you can support the ministry, then I'd be grateful through the purchase of the books if you feel that's relevant. So Romans 12, verse two, be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. OK, now your mind's going to change. Your theology is going to get, um, you know, certainly um, it's certainly going to be rattled a little bit uh, by what we go through. I know mine, my, mine has been and, and continues to be. Uh, I'll avoid jargon, okay. Uh, I'll avoid all the usual eschat eschat eschatological jargon. Uh, this sort of stuff about end times, and uh, you know, uh, we'll 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 try and keep the language as, as simple as possible. Theology, by the way, is just very simply what we think about God. Okay, so I'll repeat. This is just like a military training camp. It's like an advanced flight training school. This is no place for sightseers or tourists. You need to develop a battleship mentality you know we are not on a christian cruise liner you know with blessings every day uh and the bottom line on amiga is that you know you've got a job um and we need to find out what it is an end time job to do for in in the kingdom of god and others are depending upon you to do that job no matter what it is we're sweeping the church out whether it's preaching from the front whether it's operating the sound desk whether it's taking food out to the hungry whether it's a, a hidden ministry in prayer, whether it's proclamation, there are many, many things, but it must result in action. So at the very least, your prayer, spiritual warfare, evangelism, your lifestyle, your example, standing in the gap, being prepared to stand toe to toe with the enemy of our souls and not giving up an inch of ground, writing letters, giving money, becoming a school governor, getting involved in local politics, teaching, counselling, being salt and light. Keep kicking the devil is, uh, is, is a wonderful watch phrase, yeah? Taking the gospel to this generation and demonstrating the love of God. Okay, so there you have it. There's a lot to consider, isn't there? I'm sorry it was slightly longer than I planned, but we needed to cover everything. I'd recommend you get on your knees now and spend a few quiet minutes in the presence of God. Ask him what he wants you to do next and make sure you listen when he speaks. Remember, Prayer is a two-way street. It's not a monologue. Make sure you subscribe for the alerts, but keep an eye on the website too in case we have to move platform from YouTube. And for those watching this teaching in 2021 and 2022, please be patient as I roll the material out. Drop me a line if you like through the website on the contact form if you want to get in touch. And here's a memory verse for this module. The Lord says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. And that's from Isaiah 41. I hope to see you again soon in module one, where I'll explain the spine of biblical prophecy, Jesus' major end time prophetic discourse and the bedrock on which all last day's prophecy must be founded, which he shared with his disciples the day before his crucifixion. So make sure you read Matthew 24, Luke 21 and Mark 13 before you watch that episode. 
Thanks for watching.